uh, Bill Cotter is um, is such a scholar. He's done these books in conjunction, you know, he's written them with another gentleman named Bill Young. But it's Bill Cotter that we talked to today here on the Pop Culture Road Trip. Again, this is the Arcadia Publishing Spotlight. I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, Bill has some great stories about the World's Fair and his thoughts on um, on where they were, where they ended up being, and just sort of what the overall history of them is. So enjoy this. And again, if you go to Arcadia Publishing, any purchase, enter the code word radio, you'll get a 15% discount just for being a listener here on the Pop Culture Road Trip. Bill, let's. You, you've done. You've got your own sort of uh, pantheon of Arcadia titles under your belt, but there's one in particular that has a certain timeliness to it. Uh, Vancouver's Expo '86, uh, with the Olympics coming up now. Let's talk about that book a little bit. Um, if someone were going to Vancouver today for the Olympics and they had their, your book with them, what would they discover? Would it, would it make it easy to just you know explore the city and see what's left from the Expo in '86? Hopefully it would help. There's not a great deal left these days because uh, up until a year or two ago you would have found a fair amount left, but they tore down a lot of it to expand and build the Olympic Village on some of that site. Mm-hmm. The, the major thing there is the Science Museum, which was the theme structure originally to the uh, Expo 86, and that's certainly very visible. A lot of it, uh, unfortunately, in the last past uh, 12 months has uh, hit the, uh, you know, the, uh, the wrecking ball. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting because then you go back to New York City, which is the basis of a couple of your other books in the famous World Fairs from the uh, late 1930s and mid-1960s, and a lot of that structurally is still there if you go back as you document in your books. Yeah, the big difference, though, was that the New York site was always planned to be a park. That was Robert Moses' whole reason for doing a fair, was to hopefully make money and then make his park and improve upon it. Vancouver was not intended to be a park. It was a, a absolutely disused part of the city, old rail yards and old docks and that sort of thing, and the city was glad to get anything done with it. But there was never a plan to leave a, a, a park or a monument in its place, as Moses had hoped to uh, for New York. So Vancouver, while most of it's vanished, that was exactly the city's plan, and it's, it's followed very carefully with the uh, initial plans to revitalize and bring some, some people back into that part of Vancouver. Bill Cotter is the author of several books for Arcadia, uh, the World, New York World's Fair, 1939 to 1940, uh, New York World's Fair, 1964 to 65. Um, what was your first World's Fair, Bill, and do you think that had any, um, you know, the impact, obviously, to make you such a kind of scholar in the field today? What was it? What was your first, and, and what do you think it was about that World's Fair that inspired you? The first one was the 64 Fair in New York. I was 12 years old when I went, and I had heard about it because my uncle was working for uh, New York Telephone and was out there doing a lot of work on the site and kept telling us all these great things you were going to see. But when I walked through the, the gate the first time, it was one of those you know, breathtaking wow moments. Um, I, years later, I ended up becoming an engineer, and I guess even at age 12, I had that kind of bug in me. But just looking at it, buildings like the Bell System building or uh, sitting on, on these giant pylons floating in air or the U.S. Pavilion, the architecture and the unworldliness of it really just got to me. It was so different than what I had grown up, you know, looking across the street in Brooklyn. You see a, another set of houses. You go out to the World's Fair and you've seen the future, Fantasyland. It, it really just had an impact on me that was uh, sort of remarkable. And I guess that was sort of the point of them, too, is to sort of inspire the next generation and give you a peek into the future. Um, what's it like when you go back now? Do you, do you think a lot of the future was realized? I mean, because, again, your books are like, you know, like Arcadia books, loaded with, with classic vintage images. When you look at those images today of the World's Fair, did we deliver on a lot of those promises, do you think? We delivered on pieces of them. In some cases, I'm glad we didn't deliver on all of them. Like General Motors had a, a machine that would take the Amazon rainforest, chew it up in the front, spit out a polished highway in the back, complete with lane markings. Uh, you know, thank God we don't have that. Uh, we had a lot of things though that people don't really realize were predicted at the fair. Computers, for example, were a big, big item at the '64 World's Fair. It was the first time people, for the most part, could sit down in the terminal and put in a query, and you could get questions answered about favorite uh, recipes or dates in history or famous places, things along that line. And and the prediction of the information age, I think, really was the biggest thing out of the fair that was was accurate. The the flying cars and the undersea uh, hotels are are not quite there yet, but, um, you know, what we did in space, what we've done in computers, some of the breakthroughs in medicine, those thankfully have all come to be. 
Bill Cotter is talking about his numerous books about World's Fairs. Can compare your book, Bill, from the nineteen the book about the nineteen thirties World Fair to the sixties. How many things changed, and how many things were carried over between those two famous World's Fairs? Almost everything changed between the two fairs, other than the site plan. Uh, if you go back and you take a map of the thirty nine fair and you take a map of the sixty four fair, they're very very similar. The theme structure is in the exact same spot. The major fountains are in the exact same spot. That was all done to save money. There was no sense in ripping up the roads and changing the the infrastructure under the ground as they didn't need to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, About the only pavilions that were left were the New York City Pavilion and the uh, the amphitheater. A few other minor buildings were uh, you know left over and and, uh, off to the side. But at the end of the thirty ninth fair, it was pretty much a scorched earth policy. It was going to be a park. It was going to be beautiful. And all of those beautiful 1939-40, you know, style buildings, they, they all came down and the park then sat there unfunded, unfulfilled until the 64 fair came by. Mm-hmm. Now, if someone were to go back to that site today uh, with your books, do the books become sort of interesting tools to help you stand and line things up as to where they used to be? I hope that they do, uh, particularly the 64 book. The, the second one that we did has a whole chapter on what became of the fair? You know, where did the bits and pieces of it go, and what does the fair site look like now? Uh, I took pictures that were from the fair. I walked through the park for a day, lining them up with some very uh, patient assistants, trying to get the perfect angle and you know get people out of the way so you could see the uh, you know the remnants of this or the pieces left of that. And I try to describe you know what we're looking at and what's left. And there, there's a amazing amount of little things we know where to look and. You follow your path around the park and look down at the ground, and there, there's uh, pieces of buildings popping up out of the ground as the earth has continued to settle. Mm-hmm. And as a result, you can, you can start making your way around and, and realize just where the Vatican Pavilion was, just where the New Orleans Pavilion were, things like that. Their footprints are, are becoming more and more visible over time. Who do you hear more from in regards to these books, especially about New York, Bill? People who were at the fair and use your books as sort of scrapbooks to go back in time, or people who weren't there who used them to learn about what the fairs were like? I'd say the former. Um, a lot of people get uh, the copies of the book and say, wow, I'd forgotten about that, but I remember riding the, uh, the, the giant uh, Ferris wheel that was shaped like a giant tire, or the dinosaurs. Everybody remembers the Sinclair dinosaurs. So it's those sort of things. A lot of people use them as uh, you know a trip back to their own childhoods, which is frankly why I wrote them in the first place as an ex- excuse to go back to my mine. <laughs> uh, a lot of people also use it to show their kids this is what a World's Fair used to be because we haven't had one here in North America since 1986, mm-hmm. and people just don't understand the scope of these things. I mean, the, the breadth of of some of these fairs has just been breathtaking. It's it's amazing how much effort and money was put into it. Bill Cotter's talking about the series of books he's written on the World's Fairs. You mentioned 86. You also did a book about the 1984 New Orleans World's Fair. What was that like? The 84 World's Fair is is an interesting one. It was a failure in many ways, but if you were in New Orleans, you would have said, wow, that was one great summer. (laughs) Um, it, It wasn't a big fair. It lost money. It, it didn't produce any really memorable pavilions or, uh, you know, great shows. But in the aggregate, if you were there, I think you were happy you were there. Um, New Orleans is a great city, lots of energy, lots of uh, life and, and pride in itself. And I think the people from New Orleans really just had one, you know, one great summer enjoying themselves at the fair. And fortunately, the rest of the, the country and the rest of the world didn't come down, and as a result, the attendance was low. But I... I don't think many people that were there really walked out of it with a, a complaint. It was just not enough people went in the first place. Were you there by any chance? Yeah, I was uh, able to go down. I had a job that I did a lot of traveling, and, and that was one of the areas I was able to swing by. And uh, New Orleans in summer is hot. I don't know if I would have gone there if it wasn't for the fair at that time of year. But uh, you know, how, how can you miss two great things, as a fair in, in New Orleans together? Well, Bill Cotter, I want to thank you for all the, the time and energy you put into documenting these expositions. They are really classic pieces of Americana, and I think your titles are wonderful representatives of that. So thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I really enjoy it. And, and every time I start one of these books, it's hard to, to finish them because there's always one more picture I want to put in or one more chapter I want to write. And as you know, writing for Arcadia, there's a, a very fixed page limit on, on what you can do. But it, it's to me, I just have fun doing it. Uh, it it's really uh, just great to go back to these years and uh, you know see when the world was going to be so much better. 
And thank you to Bill Cotter for joining me here on the Pop Culture Road Trip to talk about all the books he's written for Arcadia Publishing, about the World's Fair and some other things. The Arcadia Publishing Spotlight is heard each week here on the Pop Culture Road Trip. And right now, as I mentioned earlier, as a special for listeners, Arcadia is offering you 15% off of any Arcadia titles, including all of Bill's. Simply go to Arcadia Publishing, make your purchase, and enter the code RADIO at checkout. Find your place in history with more than 6,000 titles and also find a 15% discount at ArcadiaPublishing.com.